And so I went over there and I opened the door and I walk in and it's this living room and it looked like a bomb had exploded. <laughs> and there were all these components and there, was, there were arms and propellers and motors. And I looked at it and I was like, what is happening here? He's like, Romeo, I got all of this from China. Help me build it. So you're the SVP at Altarian right now. Uh, the SVP of uh, strategy, sorry. And uh, before your work at Altarian, you used to work at DJI. And how long have you been working in the industry? Yeah, so I, I feel like I'm one of the old timers. It's uh, it's year 12, and uh, you know we've we've seen the entire industry go through a variety of different phases and maturities phases. So. Uh, the last 12 years have been a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of companies come and go, but yeah. some of the people stay, and it's good to see that. And it's good to see you that you remained in the industry after leaving the AI and that you're making still a lot of efforts to push the technology forward. So thank you for doing that. Um, I want to give the audience some context into who Dromeo is and uh, why you take the decisions you take in the later conversations that we're going to have the topics. But I want to ask you, what's your background? So you may have detected an accent as well. So I was <laughs> born and raised in Switzerland mm -hmm. and uh, uh, an event happened in the mid 80s that really shaped me and my desire. And that was the start of Space Shuttle Challenger mm -hmm. and its demise. Uh, it was very tra traumatic to see this amazing rocket take off and then, you know, a few, few seconds into the launch, starting to develop problems and ultimately explode, uh, unfortunately killing all astronauts on board. But that for me was a trivial moment in, in my youth because it started my fascination with rockets, with space exploration, and it started my interest to, you know, figure out technology that can protect us and help us and that really if I go back is one of those butterfly moments where uh, my trajectory started to change. You were still in Switzerland back then. Yeah. What sort of, do you say this is like a, a critical moment in your life? What type of changes did you make to pursue this new dream, like this new passion? So yeah, so we're going back to the mid 80s and yeah. there was no uh, computers and no person, no, no internet. So I, I wrote letters to NASA asking for more information about what happened. And of course, you know, you send letters and they take forever and then you, they go to NASA and they go through, I don't know how many hands. Yeah. And then months later, you get a response. And I would take the responses and my English at the time was non-existent. So I had to first translate that into German. Oh, wow. And then I published a newspaper, a school newspaper with the sole intent to educate my fellow students about this incident. and. Through all of that, I got fascinated not only with the technology and the space exploration part, but also English. So that's when I decided someday I will move to the United States and I will work on a NASA space mission. And uh, I finished my education in Switzerland, then uh, applied for a green card. And at the time, there were not that many Swiss that were interested in, in being part of this diversity program through the green card, and I got it. And uh, early 20s. To, you moved to California? I moved to California and started a new life. And once I had citizenship, then uh, I really focused on getting my foot in the door at, uh, on a space mission. And what was your first, I don't know, entry into this new passion of yours? Like once you were in California, what was the first role you had that was related <laughs> to this technology? Well, my, my first role was actually working in a movie theater. Nice. And it was, it was uh, an interesting experience to say the least, but that's, that's what shapes us. You know, we, we have to go through these moments of, you know, sometimes pushing yourself Personal below. growth. Exactly. Um, but then of course, Silicon Valley, uh, I got into technology. Uh, back in the days, the computer technology mostly, and uh, always with that vision that I will get myself into that. Was this the 90s? That was, in the meantime, it was the 90s, uh, late so 90s. So you got the internet bubble then? Yes. Right in the middle of Silicon Valley? Yeah, it was, it was quite amazing to see all these companies and then all the new companies that came right after. 
And then in, in 2001, I, I joined, actually, I was supposed to get citizenship in 2001, but then 9-11 happened, everything got pushed out. Yeah. And in 2002, I got citizenship, and then I joined the Solar Dynamics Observatory, a NASA project that was, had just started. And we were building this extremely sophisticated satellite that is now in space observing the sun in very high resolution with uh, filters to see all the different layers of the sun so we can really study and predict space weather just like we do with hurricane prediction yeah. because technology and solar storms don't really mix that well. So emerging technology at the time and you landed a job at a research job at a NASA basically. Yeah. And what happened from there? Like, I mean, honestly, if I landed at NASA or a research job at NASA, that would be like my, my, my plateau right there. But you kept yeah. on going. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I didn't think I would ever have a more cool job than, mm -hmm. than that. So our mission launched, um, and then I had a little bit more time uh, because now the satellite is in space, so it's more the science phase started. And I started to do a lot of projects, outreach projects, and I worked uh, with Houston with the, the manned or the crewed space side of things. So astronauts going to the International Space Station, staying up there for six months. So I was doing a lot of uh, astronaut support there. And that was, I mean, that childhood dream come true. You were true. working hand in hand with the astronauts. It, it was amazing. And so that's when I really thought this will never, ever get any better. I have peaked. <laughs> and. Around the same time, my best friend, Mark Johnson, um, he called me over one day and said, you got to come back by my place. I have to show you something that will change both of our lives. <laughs> and I went over there and Mark is, Mark has a forensic analysis company. So they do a lot of accident reconstructions from car, airplane, train crashes, uh, murder cases, and aerial footage was always needed. So he had to rent helicopters or airplanes, get photographers so that they would fly over certain areas, get the imagery, and then create, recreate, in essence, the, the, the accident sequence. And so I went over there and I opened the door and I walk in and it's this living room and it looked like a bomb had exploded. <laughs> and there were all these components and there, was, there were arms and propellers and motors. And I looked at it and I was like, what is happening here? He's like, Romeo, I got all of this from China, help me build it. And I'm like, help you build what? <laughs> and he's like, this is the latest and greatest and you fly remote controlled airplanes. So once this is built, we will go to the park and we'll fly it. And I was still not sure what it was. Well, several days later, it was this see-through dome with technology inside with some legs, with six arms and propellers. And it was amazing. So we're in downtown San Jose and the airport, San Jose airport is not that far away. This is by the way, before restrictions, before airspace oh, restrictions. Yeah. So he was good. No illegal flying. At the time, <laughs> nobody knew what, what this technology was. And we go into the park in downtown um, San Jose and I have no idea how this thing flies. And so we get it to spool up, it takes off and it actually did kind of hover. And of course, suddenly you had all these people around us and they were all looking at what was going on. And it was just, it was magical. And so we initially put some, some cameras underneath it. There were no integrated camera systems. Um, we even put iPhones underneath it with, with you know, duct tape just to see what can be done. And that was really the start of us doing early photogrammetry and aerial photography. And then that started the next, you know, chapter of my career. <laughs>